to the book of Luke chapter 15. And I know you thought that I would never get back, but I haven't forgotten you. The book of Luke chapter number 15. Of course, this is the story of the prodigal son. If I can find it, amen. Chapter 15 and verse number 11. This is part, either part three or part four. I think this is part four. But I have a special title uh, for this lesson tonight, and I'm going to entitle this Beyond the Reach of the Ministry. Beyond the reach of the ministry. The older I get, the more I love everybody. Isn't that amazing? It just, I just love everybody. And the older I get, and I suppose it's natural, the more I want people to love me. Does that make sense? I'm too old to hate people now. Uh, I'm too old to offend people now. I received an email, a very lengthy email. If you're going to write me an email, do you want me to read it? One line. When it gets past three lines, my ADD kicks in, and I delete it. If it takes that long to explain what you want, I can't remember what you first wrote anyway. But I got a lengthy email. Someone that I pastored 39 years ago. 39 years ago. That's a long time ago. I think Noah was just climbing down out of the ark. And uh, in uh, this email, he said, I don't, I'm not writing this email to condemn you. But every line of the email was condemnation. I offended him 39 years ago. Wow. And I offended him with one sentence. One sentence. One short sentence. Can you imagine all the sentences I have had in the last 40 years. And he wrote that email like I remembered every word of that conversation 39 years ago. I didn't even remember him. <laughs> he was only 15 years old. And yet he remembered in minute detail that one offense, one sentence in a conversation, one conversation in one church service, one church service out of years of church services. And now he was trying to get right with God because he was offended for 39 years. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've wondered why he hasn't spoken to me in 39 years. Let me tell you something. We're too late in life 
to let a passing conversation, one act or one deed by one individual to become a part of our life and it define us for the rest of our life. I want you to reach up with your right hand, and I want you to do this. I want you to knock the chip off your own shoulder. Y'all going to be preachers. Y'all are preachers. Amen. And one of the dangers of a preacher being your friend is that you become the place where he better not offend you. Because you're going to be judged not only by your deeds, but you're going to be judged by your actions. Can I have an amen? Here of late, it seems like that everything someone says or does People are taking offense at it. Y'all been watching the news too much. Would you get rid of that Democrat spirit? Can I have an amen? We got to live with one another. Now, I said all that to say this. I am... I, I, I want you to be my friend. I am your friend. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you are easily offended or you have expectations of people, you make sure you have expectations of people that they can deliver on, not just out of your imagination. And so I just want you, I'm, I'm saying that to say this, I'm going to preach tonight. It's going to be a tough sermon tonight. Amen. I am not, I'm, I'm announcing right now, I am not your friend right now. I'm going to be your pastor for a few minutes. Hello? Beyond the reach of the ministry. 15 of Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And you can be seated. Between the book of Luke chapter 12 and the book of Luke chapter 15 and verse number 11. There are 10 passages of Scripture. There are 10 stories between Luke 12 and 1 and Luke 15 and verse 11. Each one of these passages were spoken by the Lord. They were spoken by Christ. In these ten passages, it appears that he's just rattling on. You really can't find any rhyme or reason in these 12 and these 10 different passages. It seemed to me like that there's no cohesiveness. There's no one major story. 10 isolated passages. When I came across these passages, I was teaching 15 Bible studies a week. 
book, chapter, and verse. I was completely submerged in my Bible studies. And as I read these verses over and over again in Bible study after Bible study, I have preached on the prodigal son in my lifetime more times than I care to talk about. It's a relevant story. It's a story that needs to be told over and over again. But I also believe that if you're going to talk about the prodigal son, that you ought to cover the complete story of the prodigal son, not just where he became prodigal. Because there was a time when he was not a prodigal son. There was a time when he was a son in the father's house. He was a happy son in the father's house. He had fellowship in the father's house. There was bled a plenty in the father's house. Can I have a witness, somebody? And he was not the son that said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody in this room is subject to becoming a prodigal son. You are only one step away from becoming a prodigal son. And there are warning signs uh, to you before you get to the place uh, or the point uh, of no return. You say, well, if I become a prodigal son, will I have a chance to come back home? Every prodigal son uh, can find his way back home. But what you take with you and what you bring back is two different things. Can I have an amen? And when you come back to the Father's house, uh, there are some things uh, that you will never get back. There are some things that you will take with you and you will spend them along the way that you will never regain uh, when you get back. If on your way to becoming a, a part of the pig pen uh, and you take your family with you, you will come back home, uh, but your family may not come back with you. You may take your character uh, with you when you leave the father's house, uh, but your character may not come back with you. You may have a good reputation uh, when you leave uh, the Father's house, uh, but you will never regain uh, that reputation uh, when you come back again. Amen. Somebody said amen. It's very important that when you begin uh, your walk with God and you start in the Father's house, uh, that you make a vow to yourself before God, uh, I'm going to live for God uh, no matter how rough the way may get. Somebody said amen. One of the first passages, and I'm just rehearsing for just a few moments, but the first, the first thing that the prodigal did uh, uh, that caused him to start on his journey to becoming prodigal was he listened uh, to the wrong voices. I might add there's a lot of wrong voices out there. Can I have a witness, somebody? Anytime someone comes to you uh, and they get to try to get you to walk away from the church uh, or walk away from God or walk away from your family or walk away from righteousness or walk away from good and walk away from the holy, you're listening to the wrong voice. There are too many right voices out there for you to listen to one wrong voice because it only takes one wrong voice uh, for you to begin a journey that you may never come back from. Can I have an amen, somebody? When you hang around people that are easily offended, uh, you're going to pick up the spirit uh, of offense. When you, when you hang around people that are selfish and greedy, uh, you're going to find yourself become selfish and greedy. When you hang around people that have the wrong conversation, you're going to start that wrong conversation. Can I have an amen? 
you hang around somebody that's disgruntled in their marriage uh, and they're always speaking against their, uh, their spouse, whether it be their husband or their wife, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to find things uh, that's going to be wrong with your husband or your wife. Can I have an amen? amen. Somebody shout amen with me, please. Amen. There are some wrong voices out there, and I think most of us know uh, when we are hearing uh, the wrong voice. And it's not, it's not the same uh, as hearing a wrong voice uh, as to listening to a wrong voice. We hear the wrong voices uh, all the time. Can I have an amen? I hear cussing uh, probably more than anybody else in this room, uh, but all I do is hear it. I don't listen to it. Can I have an amen? You better listen to me. Praise God. I, I am not your friend tonight. I am the preacher tonight, okay? Praise God. Uh, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, uh, but if the Word of God steps on your toes, uh, you're going to have to receive it. Praise God. When you hang around preacher uh, people that are preacher haters, and let me tell you something, the devil has plenty of preacher haters that are, uh, among us. Okay. Y'all not listening. I'm going to say it again. There are preacher haters out there. You say, you mean there's preacher haters in Pentecost? There are preacher haters in every denomination. There's one church in town that has split more than three times, and, and they've had major splits, and, and, and they're only a shell of the church they used to be. And when you start inquiring uh, as to why they had major splits, uh, they split the church uh, over stupid stuff. All because we, they had somebody that hated preachers. And they spread their hate to others. Uh, and, and it's not bad uh, to have a preacher hater among us. Uh, but when you got ears uh, that listen to the preacher haters, uh, let me tell you what, when you hate the man of God, when you hate preachers, it, it's not one preacher that you'll hate. You'll hate all preachers. You say, well, praise God, there's some bad preachers out there. And yes, and there's some bad saints out there too. And there's some bad devils out there too. Can I have an amen? And for every bad preacher, there are 10,000 preachers uh, that are overworked and underpaid uh, and less appreciated. Uh, let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, if we go to heaven, we're going to have the fingerprints uh, of a preacher on our lives. I'm, on, I'm, I'm not going to leave this just yet, praise God. I, I have no... I, I, to my knowledge, uh, I don't know of anybody here that hates me. Praise God. If, if you hate me, praise God, come see me after church, and I'll, I'll hit your nose and give you some reason to, to really hate me, okay? But I just feel very led here, praise God. So, if you've ever been offended by a preacher, let me tell you what, why don't you go to that man uh, and sit down with him uh, in a prayerful spirit and say, Pastor, I need to work some things out in my life. Uh, let me tell you what, you need a preacher in this hour. You need a preacher of righteousness in this hour. There's enough voices uh, out there to carry you to hell. You need a voice uh, that'll help you get to heaven. When I walk by somebody and I reach out my hand and say, praise the Lord, brother, I love you very much, uh, and you turn your back on me uh, while I'm trying to shake your hand, uh, I'm going to tell you what, you got a spirit. I said, you got a preacher-hating spirit. You got blood in your mouth uh, of a preacher somewhere, and it's just like a pit bull. Uh, once a pit bull uh, learns the taste of blood, uh, he becomes a vicious dog uh, that has to be euthanized. Uh, let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to have hate towards anybody, but more than anything else, you need to learn to love your man of God. Can I have it in there? Does a preacher make mistakes? Is an apple red? Sure, we make mistakes, uh, but because we make mistakes uh, does not make us any less men of, and women of God. Can I have an amen? Because this book is right. I said, this book is right. I said, this book is right.
Can I have an amen? Talk about one more thing before I move on. Praise God. There are some ministers and some preachers uh, that have ulterior motives. Years ago, uh, we had prayed uh, about 25 uh, African-American people through the Holy Ghost, and they were becoming a part of our church. And, and some of you are still here, and I praise God for that. And, uh, and, and we were trying our best to, to make this a multicultural church. I will not pastor a one-race church. It is ridiculous to have a one-race church in a many-race world. And uh, we, they, we were, they were becoming, they were incorporating in our church, and they were becoming Sunday school teachers and choir members, and 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 one of them even became our choir director, and and uh, and, and one of them is even on our our, our church board. And, and I, I believe in mixing the board and mixing the Sunday school and mixing the ministry and mixing everything. Praise God. I don't care what color you are. Color has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to go to heaven. But I don't care what color you are. You can't have hate for nobody. I said you can't have hate for nobody. Somebody shout amen. amen. And, uh, and so we had uh, an African-American preacher uh, come into our congregation. And, and we, have, we had African-American pre uh, preachers uh, uh, that was on our staff. Uh, but, but this African-American preacher came. He was from California. And, uh, and, and he came specifically because someone in the congregation contacted him and said there's 25 African-Americans uh, that's going to this white church. We are not a white church. That building has tan brick on it. We're a tan church. I want somebody to listen to me tonight, okay? I'm not going to be in a hurry. I'm going to preach a while, okay? I said, we are not a white church. We are not a black church. We are not a Mexican church. We are not a Filipino church. We are the church. And we serve the one living God. And we're all going to one heaven. And the first thing you know, uh, this preacher uh, came uh, uh, among our, our black preacher, and I didn't know he was a preacher. I thought he had just moved here, and he wanted to become a part of our church. And like an idiot, I just accepted him in, but I didn't know he was going uh, from house to house among our African-American families uh, and telling them uh, that you don't need to be going to hear that white preacher. That white preacher is prejudiced. You know, it's amazing how I am the most prejudiced preacher in Wichita, according to some, and yet we are the most mixed church in town. Why don't you go to the all-white churches uh, and say you are prejudiced? Uh, why don't you go to all-black churches uh, and tell them you're prejudiced? Why don't you go to the all-Mexican church and tell them they're prejudiced? And I'm going to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, we got to all worship together if we're all going to go to heaven together. Because if you can't worship with someone of another race, you're not going to go to heaven with somebody of another race. That's just good preaching now, praise God. And the first thing you know, we lost almost all 25 of those new converts and, I, and the next thing you know, I find this African-American had started another church on the other side of town with these 25 people. And when he started collecting their tithe and he collected the money, he pocketed the money and he went back to California and left them high and dry. And many of them were too embarrassed to, to come back to where they were really born. You got to be careful about somebody that gets on your case about you changing churches. You better be careful about somebody that will attack another man of God to get you to follow them. 
I'm preaching and I know I'm preaching. Praise God. Amen. Let me tell you what, you got one chance to get to heaven. You got one journey to take through this life. And you got to make sure that you're on the right path uh, and the right place uh, because that journey is going to mean everything to you. I feel, I, I feel a wave of the whole. I, I am saturated with the Holy Spirit right now. Praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody in this room is perfect. We all make mistakes. Can I have an amen? But when a congregation uh, has a forgiving spirit. Boy, y'all missed that one. I said, we got to all learn how to forgive one another. Because if you don't forgive me, you can't go to heaven. I got you over a barrel right now. Come on, I dare you hate me. Hallelujah. But it's not just the preacher you got to forgive. You got to learn to forgive your brother. And you got to learn to forgive your sister. I'm preaching. I said, you got to learn to forgive one another. I said, you got to learn how to forgive one another. Amen. And you don't want to wait until just before you die and you're on your deathbed and you got one eye closed, uh, you got one eye in the grave, uh, you got another uh, foot in hell, and you open that one little left eye and say, okay, I think I'll get right with my brother now. It don't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. Because when you wait to the end uh, to, to forgive somebody, how many people have you destroyed along the way with that evil spirit that you've got? Can I have an amen? Let me tell you something. In this world right now, we need one another. I need your worship. You need my worship. Somebody shout amen. Anyway. Don't listen to the wrong voices. And then the second step towards becoming a prodigal was a change of, when you listen to the wrong voices, you're going to change your appetite. Can I have an amen? And then the third thing that happens, and, and, and this is where I'm going to start with new material. Once you listen to the wrong voices and your appetite changes, what do I mean by appetite? It used to be that you loved the house of God, but now you start loving the things of the world. And when you start loving the things of the world, your priorities will change. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, if you'll turn there very quickly with me, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself, make him to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he come in the second watch, or he come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Now, when I say your priorities change, when I got saved, my, my, my top priority was to walk on streets of gold. It's not the man that starts the race, but the man that finishes the race. Can I have an amen? amen? And the older I get, the older I get, the more I see clearly the gates of pearl and the walls of jasper and the streets of gold and the river of life that flows in that place. Can I have an amen? amen. Uh, I'm reading a book right now. I'm actually reading two books. One of them is called Beyond Death's Door, and the other one is Before 
death. And, uh, and both of these books are written by a man by the name of Maurice Rawlings. And he is not a preacher, but he is a cardiologist uh, and he is a doctor. And he, in, in both of these books, uh, he is describing uh, situations uh, that he has been in. For instance, uh, one day uh, he was uh, 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 examining a patient and he said, I think you need to do the treadmill. And so they put him on a treadmill and they had him wired up and uh, they were doing the, uh, 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 the stress test on him. And right in the middle of the stress test, uh, he fell on the treadmill and he dropped dead uh, before the cardiologist's feet. Now, there are two kinds of death. There is clinical death and there is biological death. Now, the difference between clinical death and biological death is uh, that when your heart stops beating uh, and, you, and you have no pulse uh, and you have no respiration, uh, uh, your, your body continues to live uh, for approximately 11 more minutes. And in that 11 minutes, uh, they can revive you. Now, you're dead. You're, 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 you're not graveyard dead, uh, but you are clinically dead. You have no pulse and you have no respiration and, uh, and all biological functions uh, began ceasing uh, and, 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 and so on. But in that 11 minutes, uh, uh, if you get to the doctor in time, if they can put the paddles to you, uh, 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 if they can thump you back, uh, 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 they can bring you back again. And so uh, when the man fell dead, uh, they turned the treadmill off, they laid him flat, and they began to give him uh, 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 the paddle treatment, and uh, they started shocking him. And, and, and every time they would thump him back, uh, and he would open his eyes, uh, and, he was, and he would grasp for breath, uh, and he'd say, don't let me go back, don't let me go back, don't let me go back, save me, save me, save me. And, 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 of course, uh, when they quit shocking him, uh, he would drift back out uh, into death and they'd have to re-shock him. And, and they did that many times. And every time they revived him, uh, he said, I'm in hell. I'm in hell. Save me. Don't let me go back to that place. Bring me out of that place. Uh, and, and, and finally, they was able to stabilize him and bring him back. Uh, and they put stents in his heart, whatever else they'd done. Uh, uh, and afterward, it shook this doctor to the core. And, and after uh, the man, I started getting all right. He went to him and he asked him about his experience uh, uh, when he died. The man could not remember his experience when he died because he went to hell and, and, and when he died. And, and so this doctor uh, got curious uh, as to if it was happening very much, and he traveled all over the world, and he talked to doctors uh, that had patients uh, that had out-of-the-body experiences. Let me tell you something. Whether you believe it or not, we're all one day going to die. And we're not going to be clinically dead. We're going to be biologically dead. Can I have an amen to that? And, 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 and so uh, this doctor, uh, uh, I'm reading these two books uh, about these kind of situations. Uh, and and I have, I've had two uh, different experiences uh, with clinical death. And both of them looking back, were brought on by nitroglycerin. And uh, uh, I am highly allergic uh, to nitro. And, and for years, uh, when I had my first uh, 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 stent put in my heart, the doctor made me carry a little bottle of nitro pills uh, in my pocket. And uh, every, every six months, I'd have to get a new bottle because that bottle stayed in my pocket so long and, and, and they shook together and it became nothing but dust and I'd have to renew it and get new pills uh, all the time. And I didn't even realize that I was just a little bitty bottle away from death. Uh, if I would have taken one of those pills uh, uh, when nobody around, I would have died because I am so allergic to the, to the nitro pills. And one day I was in uh, the emergency room and and I was having chest pains uh, because of a pinched nerve uh, in my neck. And I, I tried to convince them I'm not having a heart attack. I got a pinched nerve. Uh, if y'all just give me some uh, morphine or, or Demerol or uh, uh, some of that sweet stuff, I'll be all right. And, but they hooked me up to an EKG machine, and I had a, a, a slightly... Uh, 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 bad EKG, and uh, 
And he said, no, you're having a heart attack. And so they gave me a nitro pill, and they gave me a shot of Demerol and a shot of morphine all at the same time, and I checked out. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know I shouldn't say this from the pulpit, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to say it, and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just being truthful. I love that morphine stuff. When he gave me that shot of morphine, man, the, the pain left my shoulder. I'm telling you, I, I believe I could have thrown nine innings of baseball to the New York Yankees. And that dimmer all on top of that. But when he gave me that nitro, my heart stopped beating. And I quit breathing. And, and of course, Brother Forsythe was sitting there in the emergency room in the trauma unit, and he noticed I straight lined, and Brother Forsythe is so cool. He walks, he just kind of ambles up to the doctor. He doesn't get excited. Next time I die, I want you to get excited. <laughs> I want you to quit imitating the J.C. Penney's mannequin. <laughs> Grab that doctor by the throat. Shake him until he can't see good. And he walked over and said, oh, something wrong with your machine up there. <laughs> But I, I remember when, when, I, when I was leaving this world, the, the peace of God that came on me. And then another time I was in Maine and, and uh, they accidentally on the helicopter gave me some nitro and I checked out on that helicopter, but I had a paramedic right there with me. But both times uh, there was a great spirit of peace uh, that came to me. Let me tell you something. When I got saved, uh, I got saved with the intention uh, of making it all the way. Because when I get to that place that I'm clinically dead and I leave my body and I, I knock on the gates of heaven and the angel says to open that gate, I don't want you to call me back. If, if, if I get them gates and, and they're supposed to open them gates for me, I want you to let me in. And I want you to weep your eyeballs out down here for me and put me right up here in front of this casket and I want you to boo-hoo. I want you to act like you love me whether you did or not. <laughs> I got, when I got saved, I had one priority, and that is I want to go to heaven. I had one priority. I don't want to go to hell. You better listen to me now. Amen. When you got saved, uh, you had one priority when you got saved, uh, and that was eternal life. Somebody said amen. I want to be saved. I'm going to be saved. I'm not going to let you keep me from being saved. I'm not going to let hate get in my heart. I'm not going to let anything stand between me and going to heaven. Heaven is the most important thing in our lives, praise God. Jesus looked at this prodigal son that had been listening to the wrong voices and had already changed his appetite. And he said, wait a minute, son. The reason you're living for God in the Father's house is because I'm coming back again. You cannot, listen to me now, you cannot live for God over the long haul without the blessings of God come into your life. Amen. I've watched some of you, when you started living for God, you couldn't even pay attention, much less your bills. I've watched God give some of your homes and automobiles and bank accounts and investments. When you know and I know that you never deserved any of that. But when you live for God over time and you pay your tithe over time and you give to God over time, God is going to give back to you 10 times more than you could ever give to him. An amen belongs right there. 
I was born and raised in a cotton patch. I don't deserve one cotton picking thing in this life. Everything that I have, I give God the credit. I am what I am by the grace of Almighty God. I've watched God give you scholarships to college uh, that you didn't know a dime when you got out of college uh, because of the blessings of God that came to your parents uh, and to your grandparents uh, because they lived for God over time. I am nobody's friend right now. I'm going to preach, okay? I know where God brought me from. I don't ever want to forget where God brought me from. I still have hang-ups of where I came from. I went into the store the other day, and I passed by the sock rack. I tried my best to just, I've been practicing walking by sock racks. That's right, I've been been practicing. I've I've been carrying friends in, in, in there with me. And walk past the sock rack and get palpitations of the heart. Get hyperventilating. And, 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 and get too embarrassed to buy socks in front of my friends. But in a weak moment, I pass by the sock rack. I got, I got a 55-gallon drum in my bedroom that's full of socks. And my wife is threatening to throw out the whole barrel. You talk about a homicide. That's homicidal threats. And I got almost to the door of that store and stopped. And and I heard a voice say, at least look at them. I turned around and went back to the sock rack. I looked at the black socks and the yellow socks and the green socks and the brown socks and the blue socks. And I, I held a pair of black socks and I said, I got 14 pairs just like that. <laughs> Put them down. Found a pair of blue socks. I got 23 pairs of blue socks. Put them down. And then there were six pairs of white socks staring me in the face. They said, feel of me. And I got to think about all the white socks I got. I got got 100% wool socks. I got 98% virgin wool socks. I got 75% wool. I I got every temperature you can think of socks. I got socks to keep your feet warm down to 30 below zero. And it's never been 30 below zero. But in case it does, my feet's going to stay warm. And finally, the six pair of socks, I picked them up and got the feeling of them. I looked at the price. They was only 20 bucks. I looked at my billfold, and I had a $20 bill. And I, I, I pulled out that $20 bill, and I looked at them socks, and, and, and I tried to fit that $20 bill around my foot to keep my foot warm. It wouldn't do it. And I traded that little old piece of paper for six pair of heavy-duty white socks, praise God. And I brought them home, and Sister Cornell had a fit because I'd bought six pair. I couldn't help it. I, I, it was just that, that, that I was raised so poor, and, and my feet stayed so cold, and I never owned a pair of shoes till I was nine years old. I'm telling you, I was in poor shape. And I'm going to have me some socks just in case it turns cold. Amen. I know where God brought me from. When I came to the altar and I got the Holy Ghost, I know where I came from. I was born to go to hell. I was supposed to have died on the rice paddies of Vietnam. 
I was supposed to be dead in a grave right now. But God spared me. And God gave me an education. And God planted my feet on the solid rock. And God gave me a wonderful wife. And God gave me a wonderful family. Praise God. Do you remember where God brought you from? I'm going to tell you what. You don't need to change your priority in the middle of the stream. Make up your mind that living for God is what I got to do. And nothing is going to take me away from that. <laughs> Hear me. The more God blesses you, the more you ought to show your appreciation to God by the way you worship and praise. I can understand a man that makes a minimum wage uh, praising God the minimum. But when you get a $10 an hour raise, you ought to give God a little bit higher raise. I can understand you have an oil leaking forward and, and you praise God like you drive oil leaking forward. But when God gives you a new Chevrolet, you ought to praise him the Chevrolet way. And if God gives you a Buick, you ought to praise him a Buick way. And if he gives you a Cadillac, you ought to praise him a Cadillac way. And if he gives you a Porsche, you ought to praise him a Porsche way. The more God blesses you, you don't need to change priorities now and say, I don't need to praise God anymore. We need to praise God more as God blesses us. I'm not going to praise God. I'll get my suit sweaty. You could praise God when you wore rags. I said, you could praise God when you're barefooted. You could praise God when you were broke. But when God blesses you, that's not a, that's not a sign that you need to change your priorities. Can I have an amen? When you was nobody going nowhere, you joined the bus ministry, and, and you had a burden for kids, uh, and you wanted to see kids come to church, uh, and, and you didn't mind driving a bus, and you didn't mind uh, being a bus captain. But as God prospered you, you got too good to mess with them nasty young'uns. Uh, you got too good to witness to people. You got too proud uh, to share your testimony with somebody else. You know what Jesus said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things would be added to you. But when you change priorities, uh, you seek first uh, the dollar bill. You seek first the popularity. You seek first a position. Let me tell you something. Don't ever get away from servitude. I, 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 you're not listening. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm part right here. I said, don't ever get away from servitude. We live in a world where everybody needs money to live. But if you base your life strictly on a dollar bill, you're going to make the greatest mistake of your life. I was driving down the road, going home yesterday, right after that rainstorm. And, and I got, there's an elderly lady lives on River Road just before you get to my house. She lives by herself. She's very, very old, very elderly. Now, you don't want to break in because she's got a German Shepherd dog that eats your leg off. And she has a 45 Colt. That that old woman can shoot. So a warning to the wise is sufficient. And if she misses, I won't. Somebody, that road's real bumpy. And you drive too fast on that road, you get to bouncing, and your rear end kind of shifts around. Well, they hit her mailbox. 
took it right off the ground, broke it. And her mailbox was laying on the ground. And she had pulled up to that mailbox about the time I got there. And she's down on the ground, this old woman, trying to pick up her precious little mailbox. Big old tears in her eyes. I'm not going to be able to get my old, old folks check. I'm not going to be able to get my pension. I used to sing a song. I'll put that flapper on the shelf, take a grandma for myself when that old age pension check comes to her door. <laughs> where, where did, God didn't anoint that, folks. <laughs> I pulled up, got out of my truck, and I said, what's the problem? She said, somebody tore my mailbox down. And, and she had that broken post in her hand, trying to fix it back up. It's raining, mud. And I said, listen, you just get in your car, go up to the house. I'll take care of your mailbox. I got somebody that's going to fix it for you. <laughs> and I just volunteered Garrett King to come fix that mailbox. That's how you do that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Life is not all about money. And God's not going to look at your bank account and say, okay, you're a millionaire. You can come into heaven. But he chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Amen. You better be careful about charging everybody for everything they do for you. Anybody listening? Be careful about changing priorities. It's not about you. You're not the center of the universe. I'm not I'm not finished. I said you're not the center of the universe. But when you start listening to the wrong voices, when you change your appetite, when you change your priorities, you're headed towards a pig pen. There's a song that says, if God should choose, I could lose everything in a moment's time, all I have. Belongs to him anyway. You could lose everything in just a moment of time. You let Korea shoot one bomb, and your bank account will no longer mean anything. You let Iran bomb Israel. And you let one nuclear explosion go off in our world. And you'll find out that everything that you possess has no meaning. You let a little girl, a four-year-old little girl, get neuroblastoma. And you have to leave your job and you're away from your job for a year or 13 or 14 months. And you fight night and day just to be able to keep that baby alive you'll find out what life really is all about. You'll find out what part of your life has meaning. Now, the fourth step. When you reach this fourth step, you get beyond the reach of the ministry. Luke 13 and verse 1, and I'm almost finished. I'm not going to keep you for just a few more moments. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
they made sure that Jesus knew that there were some people that were evil and that he killed them and he took their blood and he mingled that blood with their sacrifices. Jesus answering and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? You think that because they suffered these atrocities, you think they were sinners worse than you? Jesus said, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. You think they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem because they suffered such things? I tell you nay. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. When you get to the place that you compare how good God's been to you and think that you have earned your way into this thing. I get sick of these arrogant people that think they've done God a favor when they walked down the aisle and they knelt down and prayed. You've never done God one favor in your lifetime, but he's done everything for you. When you compare yourself among yourselves, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, you are not wise. Sometimes people that get the biggest hand up never reach down to lift anybody else up. Wow. I better quit while I'm ahead. Verse 12, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Who are you to claim to be better than somebody else? What gives you the right to have such pride in your spirit that you are one of the untouchables. Preacher can't preach to me because, bless God, I'm going to judge him. And the first thing you know, you start comparing yourself with everybody else. When I look at how God has blessed me, it is beyond measure. I can't even begin to tell you what I've done to deserve where I am. I pastor one of the greatest churches in Pentecost. And I'm nothing but a heel. The first time I preached, I preached 11 minutes because I had 11 minutes written down on a piece of paper when I, run at the, when I got to the end of the last period, I folded my paper up, put it in my Bible, and said, let us all stand and close our eyes. I walked out the side door and got in my car and left because I bombed. I dropped a watermelon and scattered seed all over Louisiana. I was so embarrassed. And then the next day, when the preacher, the pastor, sent me a $10 check by my baby sister for preaching 11 minutes, I decided I was going to give it another chance. 
I framed that $10 check. Praise God. I couldn't believe it. Somebody pray, I paid me for that awful mess that I'd done. But can I tell you that God has blessed me? Can I have it? Amen. When I was an evangelist and I, I, I traveled full time as an evangelist, I'd preach one revival where they would pay me and then I would donate a revival to a home mission church uh, that could not pay me. Can I have an amen? And then when God started blessing me and, and, uh, and, and I started getting paid uh, uh, more than money than I could spend, uh, I carried 20 partners and mission missionaries uh, as an evangelist. Uh, uh, for the four years I evangelized, I had more partners and missions uh, than most churches had. And I gave away all my money because I believed uh, in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Can I have an Amen. When I go to conferences, uh, even now when I go to conferences, uh, I find evangelists uh, that, that are just getting started. Uh, and, I, and I take my checkbook uh, and I write a check for $100 uh, and I give them to all uh, of the starting evangelists uh, to, to, to help them eat uh, while they're at that conference because I know that they're broke and they don't have any money. And, and, and I said, don't tell nobody what I'm doing because it's nobody's business, uh, but I just want to bless you. I want to bless those that are nobodies uh, because one day they're going to be to somebody's, uh, can I have an amen? You don't ever know when you bless somebody that cannot pay you back how God is going to return the reward tenfold. You can't have fellowship with somebody that you're comparing yourself to. These, these, these Israelites, they were, they were the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, and, and, and the Essenes uh, uh, and the scribes. Uh, they wore uh, uh, fancy clothes and all the phylacteries about them. Uh, and, and, and they looked better than everybody else. And they committed themselves uh, because they looked so much better than everybody else. And I got more than what you got and, and, and you're nobody. Let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, when you get to that place, uh, there's so much pride has entered your heart that you're on your way to the pig pen and there's no turning around and there's not a preacher that can reach you anymore. The front of our church is called the altar area. Now we don't have wooden, wooden benches for altars anymore because they take up space for people to kneel. So we don't have them. But this whole front is the altar area. This is where people can come. The altar was never made for the, 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 the unbeliever. The altar is made for the believer. It's a place where you can come and rededicate your life. It's a place where you can come and, and get right with God when you need to get right with God. When somebody comes to the front, come up here, brother. And, and they're standing here praying. Lift up your hands. And, and we all gather around them, and, and we get the oil, and, 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 and we pray for that person. And, and, and we don't know what he needs. It's none of our business what he needs. Can I have an amen? Amen. He may be up there because he's carrying a heavy load. He may be up there because he needs a renewing. He may be up there because he sinned and he needs to get right. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's not my business uh, to know what he needs. It's my business to anoint him with oil and pray that the Lord touch him. Can I have an Amen. And then when I leave church, I don't need to say, I wonder what he's been doing wrong. He's been doing the same thing you've been doing. Can I have an amen? But then there comes a time when you have sin in your life and, and, and you, you don't go pray no more. Sit down. Okay, now stand up. Praise God. And, and all of a sudden, you, instead of being on the front row, you're on the third row. And, uh, but that, that's too uncomfortable, so you move back to the fifth row. 
and, and, you, and you only backslide one, one row at a time. Pride enters in a little bit at a time. And the first thing you know, you get back to the seventh row, praise God. And, yeah, but you're still in the front section. And oh, let's get on the eighth row, praise God. And you start, instead of coming to the altar, you're drifting away from the altar. It all tells me that pride has settled into your heart and God can't reach you anymore. You don't compare it to yourself. I'm not as bad as so-and-so, and I don't do what so-and-so is doing. Uh, what I'm doing is not too bad, uh, but I'm not near as bad as somebody else. And the first thing you know, you're on the back row of the first section. That's right. Get on back here. And the first thing you know, you're on the very back row, and, 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 and you, you're too far from the preacher. He can't reach your heart anymore. He can't get you to the altar anymore. He can't get you to the front anymore. He can't reach you anymore. Praise God. I am not talking about people on the back row tonight, but I'm going to tell you what. You better ask yourself why you're sent so far from the preacher. You better ask yourself why that you're so far back uh, because you don't want to see any, you don't want anybody to see you not come to the front. You don't want anybody to see you having to pray because if I go pray, they're going to wonder what I'm doing wrong. If you don't come and pray, that's when I wonder what you're doing wrong. And when you get the place that the preacher cannot preach to you anymore, you're in a bad place. You're beyond the reach of Jesus Christ. Oh, you're not just beyond the reach of the preacher, but the Holy Spirit cannot convict you anymore. And you don't ever need a, have a need to come and rededicate. And you don't ever have a need to come and pray. That's a bad place to be in. Pride has overtaken you. And here's the problem. When you reach the place of pride, there's no returning back. The next six steps are the spiral downward to becoming a prodigal. Amen. Let's all stand. I'm your friend again now, okay? Wow. We have a, a good number of visitors here tonight. And I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry you had to hear this sermon. But to honest, be honest with you, your church needs to hear it too. Everybody needs to understand that there's a real live devil out there. And that real live devil is not reaching for the sinners. We're reaching for the sinners. He's reaching for the saints. And you've got to be careful on what direction you're traveling. Because if you ever turn back, If you ever lose your power. A number of years ago in the Mississippi River, where I'm from, the Mississippi River is 1.2 miles wide. There is over a billion gallons a second that flows underneath the bridge. It's a mighty river. It takes a strong ship to navigate the Mississippi River. They have tugboats that have 75,000 horsepower. 
and they lock these barges together, seven wide and 15 long. They chain them all together. And that tugboat with 75,000 horsepower is pushing 105 barges up the river that's filled with sand and gravel and coal and chlorine and everything under the sun pushing these barges up the river. As long as that tugboat and those engines are running full throttle, he can guide that heavy load up the river to its place of destiny. But every once in a while, every once in a while, those big diesel engines will fail. And when those, when those diesel engines fail, those barges, 105 of them locked together, filled with sand and gravel and chlorine and all kinds of wares, start backwards down the river. There's no way to stop. And before the captain gets on the radios and says, Mayday, 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 all along the river they got ports where they have tugboats. that are emergency tugboats in case a tugboat fails, they can rush those tugboats and assist the powerless tugboat. But sometimes those spare tugboats are too far away and they're out of reach. And there's nothing more destructive than 105 barges with a powerless tug loose on a swift running river and they'll hit a bridge and knock the bridges out and do damage that's almost irreparable. That's what happens when a man gets pride because he becomes powerless. And he, he, he set a drift in the river. And the damage he will do from there to becoming a prodigal is irreparable damage. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, I don't care who you are. Don't ever get to the place where the preaching of the Word cannot touch your life. I don't care if you've been preaching all of your life. Don't ever get to the place where preaching of the Word of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit cannot touch you. Because if that ever happens... Your power is broken, and you set a drift. And the damage that you will do to yourself and everybody around you, oh, you say, but somebody will come and save me. But what if they're too far away? What if you done drifted so far back? Or what if you drifted too far away? I remember a time when I couldn't live for God if I didn't go to church every time the doors were open. And now people think they're living for God if they come to church once a month. And they won't admit that they're so far from God and that they're running adrift and they're waiting for the bars to hit the bridge. Father, I thank you I thank you for the preaching of the word tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus that you not let us forget where you brought us from. And oh God, I pray, I pray in the name of Jesus to let me feel your sweet spirit again. I'm talking to somebody tonight. 
And Lord, if I knew who I was talking to, I would go stand right in front of them and I'd put my hand around them and I'd bring them to the front. But Lord, you have not revealed that. But in my spirit, I know that I'm preaching to somebody that's almost beyond the reach of the Word. And they're almost beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit. And they're almost beyond the reach of Christ. I'm asking you, Lord, tonight to touch our spirits. Lord, I've seen too many shipwrecks on the sea of life. And Lord, it's never pretty when somebody shipwrecks their life. I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, reach out right now. Reach out right now. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. To the old Lamb of God I come. I just as I am without one plea, but that. Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou bidst me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Lift your hands and praise Him right now. Sing it again. Everybody lift your hands. Just as I am without one dream, just as thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be. Come to the old land of God. I come. Everybody, lift your hand to the Lord right now. Just lift up your hand to the Lord. Hallelujah. was shed for me, and that Thou bid me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Would everybody just lift your hand and praise the Lord right now? I want you just to praise him right now. I want you just to praise him right now. Everybody just praise the Lord right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'd like to see the hand of those that will pray with me this week. Would you pray with me this week? Hallelujah. I know that Memorial Day is coming up, and I know that a lot of people are going to be traveling this week. Vacation season is all around us. And I want us to pray that all of our people that's going to be traveling, that God would keep his hand on their life and bring them home safely. Would you pray with me right now? Father, I pray for all of our travelers that's going to be on vacation and they're going to be preoccupied. And I pray that you'd let angels be in every car and protect them and bring your people home safely. Lord God, we give you honor and praise in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. Would you turn around and shake hands with one another and greet one another right now? Amen. Did I see Brother Rigo? Did I see Willow? Where's Willow? Where is Willow? Brother Rigo and Sister Tess had their baby, and the baby's here tonight. Be sure and greet them.